Because we were going to do that. Hello, everyone. For you sitting in the back, could you guys move to the front if you would like? We'd love to have you sit a little closer so you can see the screen if you want and ask questions a little easier. You know, it's high school when you're being told to move. <laughs> Welcome to CPC number five. Welcome to those that just joined. Feel free to take seats as close as you feel comfortable. We'll promise not to spray on you. <laughs> but we do want you to close so we can um, all see the slides really well. And I will pass this over to Bora. Okay. Thanks, Donna. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, just want to take a second to introduce uh, members of our project team that are here. We've got Donna, we've got Rolando, um, Hector, I, I think Hector and Eric will be coming a little late. Um, I'm Stephanie Kinson with Bora. I'm joined by Amelie Randell. Aisha is walking around. Where's Aisha? Yeah, she's, she'll be walking around taking pictures that we put in our report. And then we've got Josh, who's a project architect here, and then Chelsea from uh, Walker Macy, landscape architect. We've got Rhonda and T from After Bruce, and they're going to be giving you an update on engagement. So, what are we doing today? Here is our very long list of items. Um, as usual, we're going to uh, talk about where we're at and what our objectives are. Um, we're going to have a short community engagement update. Um, I, we've been promising an air quality primer. We're going to have a quick primer on what is air quality and how do we think about it in our design process. A very quick end spec update that will definitely not take 10 minutes. Um, but we'll spend a bit more time on what we've been hearing to date. And then we're going to talk about the site option that we are going to be recommending to proceed with, with at the board and then starting to consider how the guiding principles that we started with way back at the beginning, how they might show up in both where we're at now and how we might want to start thinking about them as a project progresses. Um, and that will turn into a feedback exercise. So that's our big agenda. Um, and I guess we already did the objectives. Um, we're going to be considering those guiding principles in that recommended option and really talking about why that option is uh, what we want to recommend to the board and get all of your feedback. Reminder that modernizations are about the physical space, um, how it looks, how it feels, and the kinds of things that need to be in the physical place to support the things that are happening inside. The modernization is actually not about how it operates, how it's managed, and what kinds of classes and functions are in it. We do have this thing called the Ed Spec. Um, and as we talked about at the very beginning, the Ed Spec is sort of like a recipe book for all schools. All schools will need to kind of fit. It's like uh, baking a cake. We're all baking a cake of roughly the same size, but there might be some slight differences. Um, the big main ingredients are the same but there are a few customizations um, for each school. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so, as you can see, the work that we do has to have some flexibility. So we're not designing the kinds of classes and functions that happen on the inside. We're designing for it to be able to adapt for 100 years, hopefully, or longer. What your input does is it's, re it's really important to help us understand where you have strong feelings, one way or another. Um, and what is going to make this special in terms of experience, um, some of the qualitative aspects about it. So for anyone who hasn't heard me say this five times, uh, now you understand like what our objectives are and what our role is on a modernization. This is where we're at in the process. So we've been doing this since uh, basically mid-October. <coughs> we're getting close to our finish line in this phase of the work. So we're here at CPC 5. We're going to be talking about that recommended option, and we're preparing to submit a packet to the board. The board meeting is on April 2nd. We'll also have a CPC 6 uh, between the time we submit that packet, and it'll kind of be uh, a report out of uh, what's in that packet and some of the things that were developed. It'll be some of the same information you've been seeing as we've been growing this together. Um, and. Uh, 
uh, it's another opportunity for us to start to set up for the design phases that will follow, which brings us to this slide. So we're finishing up uh, kind of setting the parameters for what this school needs to be, you know, how big, where it is, um, the general uh, big picture function. Um, after this, uh, we will start actually designing more of what it looks like. Some of what we need to do now, you know, you've been seeing some pictures about how big it is and about how it feels on the site, and that's kind of a little bit of design that we, we think of that as matching. That's maybe one of our buzzwords. After this, we'll start to think about where are there windows? What does it look like? What kind of materials might it uh, have on it? What does it actually feel like? And that process typically takes 18 to 24 months before we get to a point where we're submitting it for a permit and for a contractor to start building it. And then the construction process uh, we have here, it takes 24 to 36 months. For this project, because we are doing a replacement, the construction of the new building will probably be in, a, in that 24 month time frame, but then we'll need an extra a uh, year approximately to do, uh, to demolish this existing building and then do the field that will be put in its place. That's the general timeline of where we're at. Um, Rhonda, you wanna talk about where we're at in the engagement process? <coughs>
Great question. Um, we are in communication, I don't have the exact number, but with a lot of uh, community-based organizations in the Southwest area. And so by putting out information um, to them to come join that office hour, or we are also um, developing a few surveys that will go out to gather more information in a virtual setting. Does that answer some of your questions? Okay. Anyone else? I have a question. Please. So, does the Ed Beck uh, address the question of the community hub? Because it sounds like some of the items in the community hub are more the definition of like a community college or something that's accessible to people over the age of 18 and not minor children. Copy. It's that question, so I'm going to pass that over. The help clinic that is part of the head sec is for all PPS children. It is not for kids over the age of 18. Um, in terms of community hub, uh, you are right. This is a school. It's not a community center. But we do want this to be a center of community in as many ways as are appropriate for a school to be. Um, it won't be, you know, open with a cafe or something like a community college might be. But um, you know, some of the things that have made this school a, a center of community, we want to make sure we keep those and we guard them. Um, so we will be able to get more in depth on the individual spaces in each of the ed specs um, a little bit later. Um, we're still keeping it at somewhat of a high level because we're still working on some of the specific spaces, but we've been able to establish um, kind of how many of, of different categories working with the principal and the um, uh, ed spec group within PPS. Um, there's also uh, a number of the comments that have come up. So for example, that there isn't a lot of space for students' uh, affinity groups. Some of those things are also addressed. They're not present in the existing school, but they actually have spaces in the ed spec that will really facilitate some of those activities, including some of the comments that from the special ed uh, listening sessions um, that really talked about some of the challenges that the special ed groups are facing, a lot of those, um, a lot of the spaces that they need are actually part of the standard ed spec. So there's a lot of improvements in um, the, the kinds of spaces and the way the spaces are designed in the just general uh, recipe book that we have. Any other questions about engagement? Yeah, I don't know if this is specific to the engagement that you guys have been running, but how the attendance at the workshops, like how is, how has that been? Has that been like what you guys wanted, anticipated? Do you feel like you're getting enough community feedback or is there a gap? The attendance at the community workshops has been excellent, especially after the first one. The second one was really well attended, the third one was even more well attended. I hope there are no English teachers in the room. Um, and uh, you know, the last one that we're doing is this uh, open house on March 13th, um, and it's actually the same day as band concert, so we actually scheduled it in hopes of really trying to capture maybe some people who might be in the building for a variety of reasons and just might stop by. Um, I believe that will be from four to seven is what we're tentatively scheduling that to be like. In terms of listening sessions, um, I don't know if our attendance has been what we hoped. Uh, Rhonda, you'd have to answer that. Yeah, I think I could project if that's okay. Did this work? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, our attendance has been. Um, it was really strong today. The community-based organization listening session that we hosted was well attended. Um, there have been some challenges in scheduling, like we've had to reschedule a few sessions, like with our teachers and staff of color. Um, initially, we thought that after school would be a good opportunity, but then um, we've transitioned it to a time where teachers would actually be paid for their time after school since they're already um, allotted some hours. And then for folks that aren't able to attend, for every session, I do create an online Google form and send it out to the teachers, the staff, the parents, the families. Um, so that way, if they can't physically be there, their opinions are still being tracked. Thanks for the question. Any other questions about the engagement? This is a, this is only the first step in engagement, so this is in a way setting some of the groundwork. We'll be continuing with a lot of community engagement, including reaching out to theater schools um, and uh, continuing with these sorts of listening sessions and engaging with some of the infinity groups as we um, get further and start the design process. Okay, let's talk about air quality. 
And when we're thinking about air quality, what we're thinking about as architects is how are we designing for healthy air in our building? So what does that even mean and why? Well, let's get this slide. Okay, well, first of all, little known fact, when we breathe in air, air actually has some mass. And we breathe in approximately 22 pounds of air every day, which is more than how much we tend to eat, or at least most of it, right? You know? And so it is a, it's a huge amount of what comes into our body. Um, this idea of the fish in the tank, it's sort of like us in the air, right? We, we don't think about it because it's just the way it's always been. But it significantly impacts our health, our mood, and our uh, ability to focus. And there's, uh, it's an area of work that has not been paid much attention to until fairly recent, um, uh, until fairly recently. Um, in the past, a lot of the standards that we had for things like ventilation were not based on an understanding of health or particulates. It was just to make sure that we didn't start growing mold in the building or that we, it didn't, that we could evacuate odors. So the most important thing that we need in the air is oxygen, but we don't tend to measure the oxygen. What we tend to be able to measure is the carbon dioxide. So the real question is why? Why do we measure carbon dioxide and how much carbon dioxide is too much? Because we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. If we're not bringing in more oxygen, then eventually we're building up more and more carbon dioxide in the space. And we've all been in spaces maybe where there's too many people and too little oxygen, and we start to feel a little sleepy, and we start to maybe have a hard time focusing. And so that's the, the situation in schools that we're paying more and more attention to now. It isn't that previously we didn't, uh, schools were inept or neglected. It's that it just wasn't something that people paid attention to. Plus, our buildings were really leaky. So they would get a certain amount of oxygen and air just through the leaky windows in the wall. And then we figured out that we shouldn't do that, and we started making tighter buildings without bringing in more oxygen. So that was a problem. And so one of the issues is, is that because we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to this in terms of health, there are, the current codes are really insufficient because they don't require air changes for health, they require air changes for odor or mold. Um, and so there's a growing body of standards trying to establish what is the right standard for air quality, but it's not just one thing. So as we think about CO2, Portland Public Schools has adopted a threshold of 700 parts per million. If you remember the previous primer on carbon, our current air outside and in our world has about 400, 440 parts per million just in our general air. 700 is a pretty reasonable threshold. Um, and then after that, we wanna start bringing in more oxygen and flushing out more of the CO2. So three things that we do. First, supply oxygen, flush CO2. Second, we wanna avoid pollutants that come in from the outside. And third, we wanna avoid pollutants that are inside. So how do we do all of that? In terms of supplying oxygen, first, the easiest thing we can do is have operable windows because that will let the outside air in um, and it can be customized. We can, let, we can open the windows when we need to. Um, and uh, for certain kinds of contaminants, uh, just filtration is maybe not enough to uh, get out some of the contaminants that might be in the air. So being able to open windows is one of the easiest things that we can do. If we can't, then our mechanical system has to be able to bring in even more air from the outside. Unlike water, we can't just recycle the air inside the building and create more oxygen. So we have to be able to bring it in from the outside. Previous ventilation requirements as I mentioned, they only considered odors and they were roughly to equivalent, they measured it in a different way, but it was roughly equivalent to what we might categorize as two to three air changes per hour. Um, as we've been thinking more about what healthier means in terms of having enough oxygen and not too much CO2 for the ability to concentrate, we're seeing that it's recommended and that our target is more like five air changes per hour. And so that's what we're really gonna be designing buildings to. 
in the past, especially in the 70s, when some of these um, requirements that, that took our air changes per hour down, we tightened up the building so we weren't using so much energy. And then we didn't want to replace as much air because fans took a lot of energy. And every time we exhausted air to the outside and brought in new air, we had to heat or cool all of that air. And now we've got these great things that we call heat recovery ventilators or heat exchangers. You may have heard of them. You may have some in your house now. And what it basically does is it runs the incoming air by the outgoing air. And so the outgoing air that was already heated actually warms up the air that's coming inside. And it really reduces the amount of energy that it takes to have those air changes happen. And so it's really become much more economical for us to increase the amount of air changes in our building um, through these uh, heat recovery ventilators, energy ventilators, there's lots of different words. So outdoor pollutants, well, we wanna avoid things like this. Um, increasingly, we have days where there's smoke. Those are the days we want the windows closed. We also want to avoid this. Um, some of us react more uh, badly. Some of us react in um, bad ways to pollen, and it can really make it hard to learn. Um, and so what we do is we close the windows on those days, and we have good filtration in our outdoor air coming inside. And then the fans just have to go um, up a notch to make sure that we're bringing enough air and filtering it so that we're getting those contaminants out. And MERV 14 filters are really pretty good at getting the typical contaminants that are in the air out um, and in the building. Um, the other thing we wanna do is make sure that those things are, that contaminants aren't coming through our walls and windows, and we do that by making sure that our walls are, we call it tight, right? That we don't have any holes and, and we don't have air leakage. Believe it or not, um, up until probably about 10 or 20 years ago, um, we really didn't pay too much attention to air leakage in all of our buildings. The draftiness that you probably feel if you live in a house that's older than about 10 or 15 years old is a sign of that air leakage. And so we do a lot of testing as we're constructing the building to make sure that we're not getting air leaking out or into the building while we're doing it. But, we also need to make sure that we are avoiding indoor pollutants. Indoor pollutants tend to come in the kind of materials that are put in a building. And when you think of that new car smell or that fresh paint house smell, those are actually toxins, off-gassing, um, VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds that are being emitted from materials. And so, um, if you ever go to Bora's website, um, we actually have a whole page on chemicals of concern that we avoid and that um, we try to make sure are not part of our buildings. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, external ones and a bunch of internal ones. Um, there's the base chemicals and then there's the, uh, the kinds of materials that they tend to be found in. And we just try to not have them be a part of our work so that we're not having to have the off gases in the building. There are certain things that we can't avoid, and so that's really where we have to make sure we have enough air changes per hour to flush out any of those um, chemicals that are um, unavoidable still until we invent some new materials. We also are really avoiding combustion in the building. So there are certain things that have been burning natural gas. Um, part of the climate policy is actually to avoid burning natural gas. Um, we're working very closely with PPS in the various areas where natural gas has been used, science labs. Um, we actually can get Bunsen burners that are electric, but it's different. So we have to work with the teachers to make sure that that can work. Also in our food service areas, they tend to cook with gas. Um, there's some really great non-gas ways of cooking now, but it tends to be a change. And so we have to really manage how that happens. But our mechanical and electrical systems now are all electric. And then finally, I think if there's one thing we've learned from the pandemic, it is to make sure that we get <coughs> dust, odors, and airborne pathogens like the COVID-19 virus or any of the viruses that we still get but don't always test for out of the building and make sure that those air changes per hour um, are able to continually bring in um, outdoor air and take those and um, flush them outside. So um, we have set a number of standards um, for IW Wells, we'll be designing those ducts to be delivering about five air changes per hour. 
Um, we're going to be using low 14 filters. We're going to avoid combustion and any of the toxic materials. And we're going to be providing operable windows um, for both safety, but also for resilience. You know, if we do have major power outages, um, it's nice to be able to still be able to use the building. So some of the metrics for any of you who are kind of metric nerds, you know, we already have established standards for things like temperature, right? 70 degrees to 76 degrees, um, relative humidity, 40 to 60%. Some of the things that we now monitor and um, have metrics for are carbon dioxide, keeping that under 700 parts per million, um, keeping the VOCs. I'm not even gonna try to describe what that unit of measure is, but let's just say there is one. And then particulate matter, we try to keep it really low. These are all achievable within the standard mechanical systems that we're designing for now and within the budgets that we're designing with. These are not um, cutting edge. They are definitely front edge, but um, these are all tried and true systems. Another thing for anyone who's familiar with sustainable building metrics or certifications, all PPS's new construction projects are designed to what's called a LEED gold certification. And so, so will I be. If you have any more questions about indoor air quality, because I am not Corey Squire, our director of sustainability, who knows all things, um, we will have a board for that. You can write down our questions, and Corey will make sure we get back to you with uh, good, technically accurate answers. All right, I'm gonna touch really quickly on where we're at on the Ed spec. This is a hard to read slide, but what it is showing you are, um, this is the Ed spec as a standard. This is uh, the Ed spec for Ida B. Wells currently. And then these are all of the other PPS projects with the exception of Benson because Benson has a very different um, curriculum model with the uh, um, CTP spaces that it has. So you can kind of see where Ida B. Wells right now is comparing with uh, the other schools in the district. You know, one of the main things about Ida B. Wells is that it has more of the CTE spaces and those spaces tend to be bigger. So they add some square footage to our building. Um, the blue here is core program type spaces. The red is performing arts. Green is athletics. Purple is education support spaces. All the various kinds of support spaces we have that are beyond classrooms, counseling spaces, admin, we'll come back to that. And then um, wraparound services and partner and community spaces are this light blue. And then this uh, dark one is CTE major space as well. Which one's Wells back there? Oh, sorry. This one is IB Wells. Which can you point second, out to that? The second one. This one. Oh, sorry. Thank this you. one. Could Four you? eyes. No, that's okay. Sorry about that. So this is the basic Ed spec. Thank you. This is IB Wells. And then this is the other school. So we've got Jefferson, Lincoln, Grant, Franklin, Roosevelt, and McDaniel. Um, it's not really in order. Uh, this is uh, the core program spaces. The red is uh, fine and performing arts. Green here is athletics. Purple are all the various kinds of education support spaces. This light blue are partner and community spaces, um, like the health clinic. Uh, wraparound services is this kind of orange, and then uh, this dark color are the CTP spaces. Uh, career technical education. So uh, we will be uh, continuing to develop this over the next couple of weeks. We're kind of in our final stages with uh, Aisha and the PPS um, Ed Spec team, and then there'll be some more detail in a couple of weeks when we get that board. Obviously, the CTE is here in the cell that I'm reading this stuff, right? It's far more than all of us are. Gotcha. Is that space to be? <coughs> yes. Great. Well, I mean, this, uh, this is uh, representing um, the CTE spaces that Wells is using now, in addition to additional program spaces. Um, actually, this, uh, I should have put on here the existing Ida B. Wells for comparison. Oh, that's the proposed. This is the proposed. Oh, I um, thought you were talking about existing. Yeah, no. This is the basic ed spec. This is the proposed Ida B. Wells. And I will add the existing Ida B. Wells because the existing Ida B. Wells is somewhere down here. So, yeah, the overall square footage. Overall square footage. Yeah. I think it would be really helpful to put both of those side by side. Yeah. So they would understand. 
can I will, have it changed by the next meeting. I will do that next week. Thank you. Thank All right. Um, any questions at this high level on the ed spec? Ben, I'm going to turn over to Amelie. Thank you. <coughs> hey, so um, we are coming off of CDW, the Community Design Workshop number three, and CPC four, um, or the last meeting that we had with you all, and here's some of the photos from that. At each of these meetings, we brought two schemes, and <clears throat> we got some really great feedback on both of those schemes. They are called Scheme One and Scheme Two. Um, these should look familiar to you. So we got all of the post-its and uh, some additional emails and all sorts of comments that were kind of coming in, and we really tried to synthesize them and um, list all of the commonalities here and some of the strong themes that were emerging in terms of successes and challenges for each scheme. And I'll go ahead and read them here, um, just as a refresher, and I know the text is pretty small for those of you in the back. Um, <clears throat> so for scheme one, uh, this was the scheme that kept the track and field in place. Um, it min the, one of the, some of the successes were that it minimizes western sun exposure, which we talked a lot about in terms of the building massing. We tried to do that with both schemes, we think we did a good job of it. Um, the building height of this massing was good for the neighborhood scale. The, there was a lower overall cost, uh, perceived cost, due to the, or we know, uh, due to leaving the track and field in place. That's the, that's the big one. So leaving it in place saves us some money. Um, the massing was integrated with the natural landscape, if you might remember. We talked a lot about the topography of the site and how this particular um, idea was all about just kind of uh, embracing that topography. Um, and then there were some variety of court courtyards that people really liked that were kind of connecting out and um, touching the site in different ways. Some of the challenges were with this one were that um, there was um, a, not as strong of a connection to Capitol Highway because the track and field is still where it is. And so we're not um, trying to increase, or we are trying to increase that connection, but we're not uh, making it as strong as we could be if we were to light, uh, wipe the site um, clean and start over. Um, so um, another concern about this one was that for that reason, there still isn't enough parking near Capitol Highway. Um, there might be difficult access to the west side of the building, as we have the site plan shown here. There's not clear vehicular access to that west side. Um, and then the tennis courts, this was something that was uh, really strong feedback in the community design workshop was that the tennis courts are just too close to Burlingame. Um, there's concern about pickleball um, being played at the tennis courts, even though they are tennis courts. Um, so that one shows up again in the next scheme as well. Yes. Can I just make sure that everyone is clear that the Ed Spec calls for tennis courts, <laughs> not pickleball courts. There is no pickleball program at Ida B. Wells. And yes. when Ida B. Wells has tennis courts, they will not allow pickleball Likely, they, they have said that, so be clear. And the tennis team doesn't, they don't get to practice there right now, and when there is four tennis courts there, they will return to practicing here, and that will be primarily for men, and perhaps like she said, solely for tennis. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> okay, good. Um, so the tennis courts <laughs> might, yeah. <laughs> they, um, they're, they're relatively small piece of the overall site picture, and so we're going to continue to look for places for them. So don't um, get too attached to where they are in either scheme, but it's definitely something we're trying to respond to right now and, and, and send to, to the neighbors. Um, so for scheme two, um, some of the successes that we documented were, again, that we're minimizing uh, western sun exposure, which the, was in the way we sort of uh, configured the, the massing in this one. Um, we have a stronger connection to Capitol Highway. Relocating and rotating the track and field allows us to really um, kind of optimize that connection. Um, there's lots of parking near Capitol Highway. Um, there was a variety of courtyards, again, that were connected to the site. Um, easy access to all sides of the building in terms of vehicular access um, and pedestrian. Um, some of the challenges with this one, uh, the second, there is uh, a secondary entrance. We were showing sort of two entrances to really try to draw people in from both ends of the site. Um, there were some concerns about that maybe being confusing, kind of like the problem that you have currently where there's a north and a south. Um, and that also, it could be a safety concern. No ways to mitigate that, but something we wanted to um, document and reflect. Um, the building was too close to the pool. And it was, as it's shown here, it's doable, but it's definitely um, right on top of the pool. And so it's not really um, uh, allowing enough space between the pool and the building. It could cause construction issues. It could also um, just be a little too close. Uh, for those using the pool and the building. Um, higher overall cost due to the relocation of the track and field. 
Uh, that we know, we know that's a big endeavor. Moving track and field is a really big um, dollar amount in the, in the big picture, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I will say, though, having said that, um, while there are lots of great things that this allows uh, it brings to the site and more connections to Capitol Highway, et cetera, we did not really hear an overwhelming um, favoritism for relocating the track, um, given um, kind of the, the cost impacts it probably um, uh, will have, as well as the fact that the track and field would not be usable during its relocation and its reconstruction. Um, and estimated about what, maybe three years of it being offline? Yeah. So which excuse was more prominent? The, <coughs> it's gonna cost a lot of money or we're not gonna be able to use it? That's a good question. I, I wouldn't use the term excuse. I would say when we've been talking with all of you. I didn't ask you to use the term excuse. I just <laughs> Okay, that's, I'm just saying that um, words matter. Yeah. And uh, when we've been talking with all of you, the support for scheme one and scheme two has been about 50-50. The concerns about losing the track for three years have had prominent post-it notes. There's also been concerns and prominent post-it notes about all of you being concerned about there being costs for this item. So we're trying to listen to that. The question that we've been asking is, are those costs and is the inconvenience, that very real time that the track won't be in session, is that worth to you the costs and the inconvenience? And that is continuing to be a question um, we are going to talk a bit today about what we want to recommend to the board based on all your feedback. Um, your strong voice matters. If you think that we've got it wrong, this is the time to say that. And we will be talking more about that in a minute. But Yes. So before we have the public workshop and have feedback on pickleball courts and you know, the pool being you know, a certain distance from the business community, I thought I heard presenters say that the cost to move and reorient the track and the football field was de minimis. I yeah. thought that's what I heard yeah. them say, and so that's why it turned into a consideration. You know, when you think about it in terms of a percentage of construction, it's maybe 2% of, of the construction cost. But when you're talking about a project of this size, and you think about what 2% represents in terms of millions of dollars, it's multiple millions of dollars. It might be worth a roof replacement on an elementary school somewhere else. So, while it's diminutive, thank you, within the scale of the project, like if we looked at a pie chart, it'd be really hard to see. That is just because of the magnitude of the kinds of costs that these projects all cost. What are the real numbers to relocate the track and reorient? There are some aspects of the track that we have to make sure that we understand. We've got a field specialist coming out in a couple of weeks to just do a full assessment of the existing track to make sure we're not missing something. Assuming that all we have to do to the track is uh, a resurfacing and uh, replace the lights and do some upgrades to the um, grandstands, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million to um, uh, of Delta, but that is not counting the cost to PPS for the transportation back and forth to another facility. And it also doesn't cost uh, include the cost of potentially upgrade, upgrading another facility to accommodate the programs. Some of those might be in the works for other reasons, but they would have to be accelerated. Is there the track and field plan? Right. Is there updated track? Right. That is the plan. Or transporting to Lincoln, mm -hmm. or transporting all the way over to another facility somewhere, right? So, so you know, we're talking, we probably could be saying that this is somewhere between five and $10 million of costs, of just number costs, not including time costs, or, you know, like people's time costs. Stephanie, is now yep. the time to give input, more input, or? I would love it if we could let Amelie walk through some of the improvements we made to the schemes. Okay. And then we could talk a little bit more about okay. scheme one and scheme two. Okay. If, if that's okay. Okay. We can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a great question. And we'll continue the discussion after a few more slides. Um, and then the final challenge with this one was also tennis courts versus the beach room game. Um, and then I'll add one additional piece of feedback we heard from this group loud and clear was. Um, 
some frustration with the pool and its renaming and these ideas. Um, and you all know, we had a discussion about it last time, that uh, Portland Parks and Rec does own and operate the pool. Um, so we're sticking with it for now. But what we have done with these two schemes, um, not so much on scheme one, scheme one already kind of does a good job of staying away from the pool and you can almost imagine the scheme if the pool were to go away. There, there could be something really great happening in that pool spot that maybe is a, a plaza entering onto the site or something else. Um, but with scheme two, um, not so much. The, you know, if the pool were to go, it's, it seems like the building is a little bit of a resultant of the pool being there. And so we wanted to improve it a little bit to really look at you know, what it would mean to make the building or massing and this idea more pool agnostic, as you were calling it. So pool proof. Um, so you know, how does it feel with, with, with the pool? How does it feel without the pool? And um, we've made a few developments to each of the schemes. In scheme two, you'll see a little bit more of a change. Um, so I'll talk briefly, and Chelsea will kind of add a few um, highlights to each of the schemes, and then we'll end um, with what we're recommending to bring to the board. And, and I really want to make sure that everybody understands that we did hear all of your comments, and there are discussions happening at the district level about the pool, and you know we are researching costs to cover that pool. I can tell you that it's many millions of dollars to cover the pool, but it is being discussed. So. Um, it is still a parks and rec pool, so keep that in mind. Just, just, a, quick, just a quick thought on that. Um, and thanks for the coordination. I, I submitted a, a, a legitimate public records request and haven't heard anything back on any type of the documents or- They're working the, on it. The legal or policy <laughs> or technical constraints, but just, it, it seems so amazing that such a, such a significant design challenge or, or design constraint that we're all working around. I mean, it's a learning space that we are literally stretching and forming around uh, an archaic pool that's open three months of the year. Just two yeah, months, and exactly. Can't use. And this is for a 50 to 100 year, you know, uh, plan. It just, it just, it's a little absurd. So apologies if I get a little riled up, but it, it yeah, seems like the community we're, deserves we're to you. know yeah. how yeah. to put two bodies in and negotiate a resolution to this. So anyhow, thanks for letting me vent. Yeah. Were you gonna say the same thing? <laughs> I was gonna ask what cover the pool means. Are you are we just talking? So there are a lot of different <laughs> ways to cover it, and we've talked with uh, cost estimators that have suggested some different things. There's companies like Dynadome that it's just kind of like a kit, you know, and you put something over the pool. And Is it like the bubble, like the MJCC bubble? Kind of like Monmouth Community College used to have a fabric so one, and they've now got plans for yeah. like a glass one and I think it might be operable. I'm not sure the details. I know it's many, many millions of dollars. I did talk the to them and if solve, you do, you know, if we were running a, a pool, not only needed. that, but there's the operational cost. There would be a lot of questions there as well. There's people that have to run the pool. There's um, tens of thousands of dollars in electrical costs every month. It's it's a very expensive thing to discuss and to try and work out with Parks and Rec. It's, um, is challenging. They're uh, a very good community partner for us. We all of our high schools have property that's shared with parks department. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of things in process and, and in discussion. And and I'm sorry I can't say much more now because I truly don't know myself. But I've passed along your comments and and it's all under consideration. It's th these dollars are earmarked for schools for students for school. <laughs> And, um, and none of the other schools have a pool. Um, and so there's an equity uh, aspect to also look at that if you have a pool at this campus and nowhere else, that is also can be a concern. Um, and, and, and many other things to consider. So we yeah. wish we didn't have a pool in the middle of the campus. Yeah. We, could, yeah. we really yeah. wish yeah. that there yeah. were any yeah. arrangements. I'm not suggesting any. No, we're trying to find a design that twists and forms around the thing, and we completely agree that was kind of one of the improvements we wanted to make to Scheme 2. It was doing that too much, um, given the kind of unknown destiny of the pool and the you know, frustrations with it. Um, so we feel like this scheme is actually doing a much better job of kind of working with or without it, and you can imagine that it's Scheme 1. This Scheme 1, yeah, yeah this is Scheme 1. So, <coughs> We made a few tweaks to this one, a few tweaks to scheme two, so we'll talk through them then and kind of um, 
depend on our recommendation. Can I ask just one quick yeah. question? Sorry, the pool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are the bond dollars paying for the upgrade of the pool? Well, to be clear, we're not upgrading anything. Well, there has to be something that goes with the pool. Like yeah. they're going to lose locker rooms. Yeah. They're going to lose facilities. Anything that we're going we're to be okay. having to spend dollar bond dollars to replace any of the facilities that PPS was supposed to be providing for that pool. Right. The locker, locker rooms, rooms is, bathrooms. Yeah, like locker that. rooms and bathrooms are the things that remain. They've already disconnected the mechanical and electrical systems from the building, right. from the uh, current Ivy World building but we will have to create kind of a pool house that has uh, restrooms and changing rooms, locker rooms, um, yeah. and, 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 and an entrance. It, it'll be you know, relatively minimum, but uh, minimum in the same sense that um, you know, we still have to construct a little building. Sure. Like when right? Steffi was talking about the delta of moving the track and field, right? There's still gonna be a significant amount of money put into the existing grandstand seismic upgrade, bathroom remodels, and all that, that, that really adds up. But building it brand new does cost more. And then when we talked about um, uh, embody, embodied energy carbon, uh, they will say that's a piece of it too, when you take down existing concrete grandstands. So same thing with the pool, there's um, all those same kind of considerations. So moving that pool would cost a lot more than replacing the locker rooms. And there's the added benefit of that pool support building can also double to some extent as just, you know, bathrooms to serve the athletic fields on campus. Mm -hmm. For those 10 months of the year when they're <laughs> just not serving the pool. Right. Right. Okay, one more question. Sorry. Move on. Because, like, besides having our voice, expressing our voice concerns here, is there anything else that we can do as a group of people who, I think a lot of us would say, can we get rid of the pool? Like, should we be doing anything else? Putting it in writing is, I mean, we also put all your comments in writing, but if you want to add your own letters, we can add that as, you know, a letter with your name on it to the, um, all the comments that we collect. But I will say that, you know, after our last CPC meeting, when there was a lot of, uh, some follow-up and some comments about it, I think it, it actually spurred some additional, you know, discussions about yeah. what can be done. So th it, it really does make a difference. We can't, you know, in the time period since our last meeting, we can't say that something has happened, but we can say something started, mm -hmm. some conversations have started. Um, I guess just speaking to understand, does Wells have a swim team and do they swim at that pool? We it, do, we yes, do not. We swim at the Southwest Community Center. Can hour. we get rid of the pool then? I mean, <laughs> yeah. we, do, we, we have one hour of swim time at Southwest Community Center for 65 kids. We only get one hour because Cleveland also comes yep. to Southwest Community Center and almost all of our meets are at Matt Fishman and our students cannot use the pool. Why can't we get rid of it then? I'll tell you. It's, it's not ours. Sarah explained it's, it's, not, it's not ours. But we've asked in the spirit of partnership that it's covered so our students can use it in the winter or that the heating mechanism, which apparently still works, is that the pool's heated. Of course, all of that comes with a cost. We just have said in the spirit of partnership, We'd like our students to be able to use the pool in the winter time because right now they don't they, they don't use it. So how is it heated? Do they have like do they have like a nine or ninety nine year the, lease? The city or? actually paid for its construction when the original school was built. It turns out. But yeah. who owns the land? We don't know. So, um, wait a minute, guys. Guys, yeah. there's another point of view here. There's a huge number of people that use that pool, and they use it during the summer. I know it's the only use during the summer, but there's a lot of people that do and your, their voices aren't here. And I think you really need to think about what happens with Southwest. We have one indoor pool, and we've got this pool, which is the only outdoor one here. You know, it gives a huge amount of use, and I don't think the Parks Department is interested at all in shutting it down. And, and however, we're, we're talking about being fiscally responsible with our funds, and if we're designing an amoeba around something that's not going to last for 100 years, or something that our students that is can't not use. being fiscally responsible. We've also got the political problem, which is much bigger than the fiscal problem, quite frankly, in my opinion. But let it go. We, we, we do have to make sure Thanks that on. the bond will pass through. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. And Thanks, John. John. And it's also, we'll make it our mission to not design an amoeba as well. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're trying to talk about today. <laughs> Sorry if we're not using a better use. No, it's a great, I'm mad we didn't think of that. But, uh, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's I'm, I'm feeling it curving around right now. Um, Okay, let's, let's go to question two. We'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go through these.
really quickly. Um, so we made a few tweaks to the scheme um, as a refresher to, to, to all of you. Uh, the building forum is kind of stepping up with the terrain. Um, there's moves to the west from the central com from the central commons, sort of separating two primary bars that have classrooms on the upper level. Um, a new multi-use field. The softball field will be improved. Uh, new path connecting the campus to the Ruki field and parking. That's kind of a new addition that shows up um, in the scheme. You'll see a cleaner view of it in the next slide. Um, the lower level of this build, of this uh, massing is at the same grade as the site, so it has this really great connection to the field down there. Um, speaking of new use of track improvements, pool, pool support building, um, new tennis courts, which are shown up in the north right now, so that kind of makes a little bit of a parking imbalance from north to south, um, but there is an option for that. Um, new baseball field and the main entry is accessed, and we didn't really talk about this much, but off of a pretty um, uh, strong north-south pedestrian corridor that really connects the uh, Southwest Trail, new, newly approved, uh, will be newly approved Southwest Trail along the northern edge of the site um, with this really strong north-south access, so that'll be the, the main entrance to the pool from the north and the south. And I'll hand it to Chelsea and she can talk about some other things. All right, thank you. Does that work? of this particular concept does center on the north-south pathway. So as people arrive on the site, um, they can come in from either Capital Pilot or Vermont. Um, they will find parking opportunities and then be able to filter back toward um, that pathway. If they are students who are, say, taking buses and maybe being dropped off on Capital, they're going to be coming in potentially using that nice improved trail and then coming up again on that same pathway. We'll sort of filter it from either the north and the south in that direction. For those, uh, so I'll highlight a few changes. Um, we did make some adjustments to um, the parking lot. That is partially uh, because we have now located the tennis courts on the north side, a little bit further away from some of those neighbors to address some of those sound concerns that folks had. And um, that has made us adjust a little bit of the parking on the north side. However, uh, knowing that that's a very small lot on the side that a lot of people enter on, we have provided, you will see here, a connector. So while you might come in and there may be a small lot on that north side, if you don't find a spot to park, you can come through to the larger lot at the south without having to reroute all the way around and having that be really convoluted so that you can actually come in. So that would make that a little bit easier. Yes. Is part of that walking path going to connect to like the track and field? if I'm coming to watch an event or to, you know, at the track and field, I don't see a lot of connection from the parking lot in the southeast. No, the big lot. The big lot to the track and field. So, um, right, right now in this concept, and that may be a detail that has to get worked out a little bit further, you would be coming up through the main path and then over to where the ticket kind of zone is. And if, if, the if only there wasn't that pool in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Two quick questions. Um, <clears throat> I think we heard like the grandstands in this scheme are going to be approximately the same kind of volume size. They're just going to be kind of supported, painted, but they'll they'll be in their same configuration right. as they currently are. We'll upgrade them seismically and and for accessibility and for maintenance. Okay, but no more capacity at, at all, things like that. Okay. It would. It, we have the largest grandstand currently. Okay. In if we replaced it, you'd actually, it'd be smaller. Oh, the really? Spec, it'd be yeah. a smaller ed spec, which yes. is. Okay. But it needs help. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The bathrooms okay. need help. The bathrooms will be They're scary. Wait, they're scary? Really? Yeah. I didn't know. You can take a shower in the bathroom if you want. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah from actually from like water. We'll be addressing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be addressing. Yeah. Great. They're yeah, that, that's because there's right? there's there's a lot of different <laughs> a lot of different things. <laughs> no, yeah, thank you. The the second question was as uh, as a neighbor, I, there is a ton of cut through traffic between Capitol Highway and Vermont. Um, have you heard anything from uh, the workshops, the community workshops, or other fora, where you know the community has you know said like a connector like that maybe isn't in the best interest of the neighborhood because we might see cut through traffic from the commercial district to the neighborhood? We actually heard the opposite that they were concerned that if we didn't have a connector, that people would be cutting around the neighborhood to get to the north ah, side. That's okay. Heard mostly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good to know. So they would cut down on neighborhood traffic if we could keep that in. Okay. Uh, some of the other features of this one, we have retained that idea of sort of a series of open spaces that might go to wrap around the building and occur at different levels as they relate to the Ida B. Wells site as well as some of the other um, field areas. Um, this concept, of course, still has uh, all the, the new fields and the improved fields on the Ida B. Wells site, and of course, we are also going to be improving And then moving on to scheme one, uh, scheme two, scheme two. So this is very similar to the previous scheme two. As you can see, the building footprint is a little bit more compact. We're trying to be less amoeba-like and uh, more pool agnostic and thinking about this as a building that really could work beautifully with or without the pool in that position. Um, because the track and field is relocated, we are a little bit more constrained with where the building footprint can go. As everyone knows, the existing building is right here, so that's a really big constraint for us in terms of where we can build. Um, but this results in a pretty compact and really efficient footprint. It's a little bit taller, uh, like four stories in some places, um, but additional things that we've, additional tweaks that we've made to this, um, in addition to kind of raising up the height, making it more compact, um, putting the tennis courts here, creating a more more of a um, kind of pedestrian experience between Capitol Highway and this um, entrance, this uh, western entrance to the building. We had talked about the double entrance um, from the west and the east being a little bit confusing or safety um, concerns. And so consolidating the entrance to face Vermont Street and really kind of collecting people from the northwest down a really gracious pedestrian path to that front entrance, as well as people from the uh, large southeast parking lot to that entrance. Um, and then just a little bit more space around the pool, which allows us to have a really great uh, loading um, situation, for lack of a better word. <coughs> sure. Uh, so uh, in this scheme, uh, as Emily said, we really, with our main entry down Vermont, we do still, we are still maintaining those um, <coughs> north-south axes and sort of pathways on both sides, but everyone is still coming down to a singular entry um, with the tennis courts having shifted um, into a little more inboard of the site, we have a little a little bit smaller parking lot than I think we showed previously. 
uh, but still a little bigger than the last time for the north side. So there is a parking lot there on the north side, and it does capture folks a little bit sooner as they enter into the site, which is kind of nice. You feel like mm -hmm. you've arrived, you can see where you're going. Um, on this one, the parking lots are not connected because we didn't necessarily want to pull a road all the way around the outside of the site. So that may be something that you want to give us feedback on. Um, besides that, uh, I will say, I will highlight that we have a little bit more of a gracious entry right as you come in on Capitol Highway. For, so for those who um, perhaps are walking from the Capitol side, maybe from a bus stop and whatnot, we come in on the trails and, and be able to jump onto this pathway system a little bit sooner. So again, it provides a little bit more of that uh, sense of arrival a little bit sooner than on scheme one where you still are coming in on the back side of the signal and have to come in a little bit further to to find those pathways. Thank you. All right, a few more details on this guy. So these are the entrance or the distances from the northwest um, to the current northern entrance of the school as uh, and then compared to the future sort of entrance plaza, those are about the same. Um, and then a zoom in of the interior space plan. Um, similar to last time, we were thinking that the athletics and the gyms would be on this kind of northern wing connected to the northern end of the site. And then the auditorium would be on the southeast corner. Um, because we're not doing the, the sort of dual entrance in this idea, the idea was rather that we would connect a central common um, to some terraces that wouldn't necessarily be entrance plazas. They might be private terraces uh, for use by the students, or maybe they could be entrance depending on where we go with it. Um, but that was one um, development that we thought was a, a pretty strong one. Um, and then this is a view of that massing. You can see it's a little bit taller, but it's not, um, uh, doesn't feel that much taller than the, the three-story, but uh, that taller sort of V-shape is actually a four-story massing with the uh, classrooms on the upper levels. And then the side-by-side -side comparison and where you all know we're headed with our recommendation. Um, so uh, the main three options are highlighted here as options reasons for rec making this recommendation are bolded in black here, um, clearly lower site cost um, because the track and field is not relocated in scheme one, um, but there would be minimal track and field disruption during construction and a shorter construction duration associated with not rebuilding a brand new track and field. Um, and then there are a few other um, benefits to scheme one that I could kind of walk through. We've already hit a bunch of them, um, but there is a better connection to leaky parking and fields through that new pathway that we showed. Um, there's really strong um, north, south, and east, west pedestrian connections that run through the middle of the site. Um, the southeast parking lot, um, as shown currently, has a really great opportunity for drop off and student arrival uh, sequence, um, just because it's, it is rather large and has, has that flexibility. Um, there's a vehicular connection between the two parking lots. Some might like that, some don't. Um, mul multiple loading locations. Uh, there are a few options for loading that we won't get in, into too much detail about, but they are loading uh, locations that are separate from the uh, other cars and um, the bikes and the pedestrians. Um, and then more separation between the school and the existing pool, uh, which is a big one. So it's one of more foolproof in the sense that it's not right on top, it's not forming around it. Um, so there, um, there's just a little bit, um, yeah, it's more foolproof, as we've been saying. Um, it also means, because we're not relocating the track and field, that there's a little bit more flexibility with the building footprint, um, because we aren't trying to form around some sort of landlocked object of a located track and field. Um, yes, I think that is the end of our scheme discussion. I could, I could go through these just for fun, and then we'll take your questions. Um, but this is just uh, a view from Southeast Vermont, um, at the, uh, at the, this is the existing school, so we kind of did a massing of the existing school, so we can see a comparison of this with the proposed um, scheme one for comparison. Um, this is your view looking at the track and field coming from Capitol Highway with the um, ballet pool on your right. So that's uh, the existing condition, you can't see the pool. And this is what uh, scheme one would look like from that view. These are massing models, remember, um, as we described that earlier. And this is from Southwest Vermont with uh, Ricky just kind of peeking out on the left side of the image there. And that's a view of the new school, just the massing. 
So we can take a couple of questions and then we are really excited to move into a really aspirational, exciting part of the night. I'm, I'm curious as to why neither scheme contains underground parking or a secure parking facility under the building. Why are we not able to dig into the hill? Cost the, the cost of underground parking is astronomical. I mean, to it's um, seventy thousand dollars a stall. Minimum, and and no school has it for that reason. I just, I don't, I'm not sure how much flexibility we have with like um, changing the <laughs> the the board recommendation. Um, and I just, I just want to say that what I've heard from a lot of athletes and over half our school participates in the athletic program is that we're going to have a brand new school and if we don't redesign our track and our field, we're going to have an older track and field right next to a beautiful new school that's also oriented in a way that blinds young people, athletes, while they're on the track and field. So even the previous principal, Felice Rieschich, and I, we were, were talking and we really were hoping for the new track and field. So I just want to put that out there. I also want to say, I know this is preferential. Um, I prefer not having the driveway through campus because kids are going to speed through campus. Um, I like having a green path instead. Um, that, that's my preference. I know that's preferential. So. Um, so in terms of the track, yeah, no matter what, we're going to be resurfacing the track and improving the lights yeah. and improving the fences. So it will feel right. like a new track, with the exception of it will still have concrete granite. Yeah, I mean, so it will be fixed so that they won't be leaky and gross. Right. That's yeah, there's, there's a, I mean, there's, I know there's cost. I mean, yeah. uh, as the athletic director, I can tell you right now, when you come up here, we face east-west. Oh, I know. No stadium uh, faces east-west. It's all north-south. And so when you're up here, you have athletes it's challenging sometimes mm -hmm. and if you're going to orient if, if the field is going to stay that way w w there's other things involved with that too we have people drive their cars on our field mm -hmm. and yeah. if we don't find a way to secure that better it's still going to continue like we have to lock a facility right now because kids are driving on our, our turf i think there are some really and, and good things that we could do to yeah. mitigate some of those right. things yeah I, I think what's important for us is right now um, is it important for the board to allot additional funds to relocate this track yeah. and to provide the, the benefit? Yeah. As we've been having these conversations, what we have heard from the PPS athletic director is that that orientation of the field isn't a big problem in their eyes and hasn't the been. The new one? The one that was, or the previous one? Marshall. Marshall's been there a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we and you know as we've been hearing from even this group, we haven't seen like really strong like I really think it's important to X Y Z. What we have seen are a lot of concerns about the costs or a lot of concerns about the downtime. So in terms of a recommendation to the board, um, you know one of the reasons why we wanted to to open this here for this group is because this group's voice is important, and if this feels wrong to you, this is the time to be talking about it. But I also think it's really important for us to consider also the big picture of the whole district um, and you know the, the, the very real costs of making that move and make sure that it's really worth those additional costs. I'd yeah. like to add one thing on top of this. So they are just, PPS is just now, I, I'm David May, I'm the communications manager for the bond program. So I've been on this program since 2013 and watched a number of these projects go through. So these are the last two high schools that are coming online. Um, I personally am a big advocate of, of getting these high schools finished. That was the, the goal and the, the promise that we kind of made. But if you go back to the most recent board meeting where they talked about the bond that's going to be put on the ballot, the board has to come up with a scheme, what goes on it, how much, and how is it financed? And they all have to be in a line, in, in alignment. So what gets put out here from this project is gonna be compared to what's being put out to Cleveland. Plus we just had two schools in this area shut down because of 
the storm damage. Because so, of lack of investment for so many years. Right. Because and of the deferred maintenance. 100%. And that's what so the so bond program. The time to invest in our schools and our kids, not defer it some more. Well, that's what the bond program has done since 2013. Yeah, and that's why. It's, so let's do it some more here. Well, at I guess well. Okay. But I, I, I just want to make. Investment. Okay. Can I just finish Why? my point? Sorry. Yeah. I interrupted you. I Sorry. I, no, I, I'm finish. not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I have hundred no. percent. That's right. what this program is. <clears throat> But I'm just talking, I just, you should go back and try to, you should try to find that and watch that and, and be aware as this project, you all need to be involved going forward as this moves forward and as that bond moves forward and as each board member works together and works maybe against each other to decide what gets on that bond because there's a lot of wants and needs. So if this project comes in $100 million more than Cleveland, that will be questioned. I, I'm not saying it won't or it is, but I just this is just something to be aware of for everyone to be aware. Yeah, no. I'm not talking about this being a hundred million dollars more than Cleveland. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not. Jefferson and just, Cleveland getting new track and fields? No, they're not. Jefferson not, is getting a new track. Jefferson, not Jefferson's getting a new track and field. And they're not they're apples. To, they're not apples to apples. Yeah. No, it's all so very. When you start having an equity lens, like right. let's talk about equity. Lincoln got to move their track, and they got a whole new track because they moved the building. You know, and all of these other, and we're not even like, if you look at an ed spec for athletics, mm -hmm. like as the AD was saying, our orientation of our track and our field works against any athlete or community member who tries to utilize that. And we should be looking to be like a standard in the area, like Liberty High School in Hillsboro, they host regional meets for USATF. We are not yeah. able to do that with the facility that we have. It's right. not even a real community investment. So keep talking about equity, but that's one of the things really that's under consideration as well. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, as as uh, we were asking the question about field orientation, I mean, honestly, the comments that we got were the the orientation wasn't as hard as as I thought it was. That the time periods where the sun was problematic was such a small part of the year that it wasn't considered a concern. It's not even the sun though, like for javelin wind. throwers, it's, they it's want the wind. The wind. It's, yeah. it's, you have to take into consideration things. the wind, yeah. the tailwind for long jumpers, the tailwind for the sprints. I mean, you can't beat a drum and say you're all about equity and respecting blah, 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 when all these other schools are getting new facilities except for us. Well, I will say Grant didn't get a new track and field. Um, they are getting Daniel, one. They well, are getting one because a bunch of parents said they're going to file a lawsuit. They, they didn't get one as part of their bond program. McDaniel didn't get a new track and field. Roosevelt did not get a new track and field. Lincoln only got a new track and field because that was the only way they could build their new school. Benson's not getting a track sure. and field. No. Huh? Benson's, Benson's not getting a new track and field. Benson doesn't have a track and field at all. They Buckman. use, they, I mean, Buckman is next door, but it's not Benson. But it's not apples to apples. It is not. I just went in the comment about investment and resilience. I would just ask you, I mean, I think you've all seen me be a very strong proponent of relocating this track. So for me to come around and say that what we should recommend to the board was a, a hard process for me and having me take myself and my preference out of this and think about what might be best for the bigger picture. And when we think about resilience of our schools and we think about all of the places where we need to put our dollars, I would just ask all of you if relocating the track and field is part of that equation or not, if that's the right place to put our dollars. So what do we, so I guess the other way is to work backwards. What, we, what are we gonna give up? I can tell you right now, there's a massive Title IX violation with this because of a batty cage on the baseball field versus the one for the softball complex. So if there's gonna be a trade-off, there needs to be other things factored too as well because that right there in itself, I mean, Grant High School went through a massive Title IX violation because they didn't take care of softball, right? So what are we giving up if we don't, invest into a brand new facility well we weren't we we hadn't addressed that yet in either scheme okay. so that's not a different okay. um, Aisha you had your hand up and then Jeff and then is it possible to kind of go for the gold with scheme two and let's say the board says no no can do and then I mean can we is that just not a way well, that the process no. works? And then we can say, well, well okay, we can. What I will say is the question is whether or not we're allotting extra funds for the relocation of the track. But where we're at in the process, mm -hmm. we still have so many unknowns mm -hmm. that 
it is it is actually possible that within the scheme one budget as we have it that we could still afford to relocate the track mm -hmm. once we get the geotechnical report once we get the survey and we've got a whole bunch of things that are in process and and so we're having to have a certain amount of dollars just allocated to that risk if some of those risks come in lower as we said it's a relatively small part of the project it's smaller than our contingency but right now i think the question is what are we recommending to the board in terms of the budget and what the budget should support and should we be allocating an additional approximately 10 ish million dollars in project funds towards that element oh so you really don't have a geotechnical report you don't know if there's underground ground wells where you don't know how high the water table is don't so right now we're carrying contingency for that risk it's in process we have some information but not a complete picture Jeff so this is uh, deviating from the, the current the current topic um, one of the reasons for scheme one up there on the board was uh, less of a disruption to our athletes that use the track and field even you know um, sports teams etc I heard I think at the beginning of the presentation that maybe and as a parent of a sixth grader Robert Gray at Jackson I'm familiar <laughs> with what Jackson has to offer um, was there mention that the Jackson track could be improved and could host Ida B. Weld track and field cross-country runners javelin throwers during the construction such yeah. that we could I have to defer yeah. to our Isn't that, Sam's kind of yes that's that happening plan. right that that is that would be the plan as we've heard uh -huh. that would be great so i think that would that would for, in my opinion reduce like the the benefit of scheme one because most of our athletes who use the track and field could theoretically commute the 15 minutes over to jackson uh, jackson middle school uh, to use their I track call jackson high school I, yeah. I know. Okay. so uh, anyhow i just the, the shorter construction duration you know if, if there is an, another track in the neighborhood that they could use temporarily it's not that far actually was highlighted for us really for the first time fairly recently so we're just starting to study it and if there are some ways to mitigate it um, you know because wind will go right over certain walls you know it's like water um, you know we'll let we'll definitely take that into account you know see what we can do and honestly even if we relocated the track we'll still have the wind will still blow so we'll really have to consider like what was that reoriented track to to the wind as well, right? That was gonna be my question actually. Does rotating the track and moving it actually fix the wind problem? It will fix the sun problem, yes. but do you know yet? Uh, we don't know yet actually. So we've only just started thinking about like, huh, yeah, that, that wind is pretty strong, especially during uh, certain times of the year. And I, as recently I was at my son's soccer game and experiencing that wind firsthand, it was really cold. So um, I, I was thinking about all of you because it was just a, right after that last community design workshop where it came up. Um, you know, so I, I don't know that rearranging the track would actually improve the wind, um, the, the experience of the wind. It might just change its orientation, but we don't know. Yeah. I appreciate all the need for athletic performance and, and all that. Um, uh, my preference for scheme two and the reorientation of the track and field is so that when you come in to this facility from Capitol Highway, which should be the main entrance, you know that's that's where all the traffic, public traffic, is coming through. Um, you actually have an entrance. It's not the back of a grandstand to look at. I'm sorry, even if you make the grandstand 
upgraded, nicer, whatever, it's not gonna change the fact that that's what I see when I drive in on, like, it sucks. It makes the whole campus just a little less, it feels like sometimes. Like, there, there's such an opportunity there to clear that out, and like you have on Scheme 2, have some walkways, have some driveways, have some pathways, so that everyone can approach the school and it looks, you know, like an institution of learning, like a place where we want to be. Yeah, it's been one of our biggest struggles on the project is, um, you know, the, the Capitol Highway entrance, um, we can't get an address on it. So Google Maps will never send you there. It, and so because, because PPS, in fact, is priorly on that little strip, we did, and PPS doesn't have any control over it other than the access easement. Um, trying to put, we looked at a number of different options that really tried to literally put the front door right there. Mm -hmm. And between the traffic impacts on that light and the lack of ability to have an address that Google will take people to, um, it became really obvious that it was going to be quite difficult to actually have the front door there. So we've been struggling the entire time with the same situation that exists now. The fact that we've got the business district, the major traffic arterial, and in the future, by the time this opens, all of the public transportation on the Capitol Highway side. But the only way to have an address will be on Vermont. So we have to be able to have a door on Vermont. And so how do we bridge those? things and there's nothing we can do to change that that it's outside of I mean that's not really true though well there's nothing you PPS have an easement an you can get a lawyer we could talk to that's PPS good. and have them talk to right it's all city owned and controlled land it is not know. actually it's privately owned the Braid land. Braid Braid. <laughs> great so we eminent domain the hell out of them and we get the access anyway, I'm sick so of this as, as an alumna of this garbage. school like, who that's a terrible constraint hated coming in that backside I totally feel you terrible totally feel you well, our board coach is the, or our board chair currently is the track coach. So I think this gives us kind of grace for this orientation. Yeah, I'm surprised that we didn't get more community input around the north south um, type orientation. It means people in the community didn't understand or know. Yeah, it's not like if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, again, just from the seat that I sit in, it's scheme one is disjointed. There's, it's you're going from a baseball field to a track and then to a practice field. It's so if I'm looking at scheme two, and there's no driveway for the north going through all the way, but you know you have two spaces right next to each other. We have the practice field and the baseball field where you can have multiple teams using that, um, especially when you have large programs that um, like baseball has got 60 kids in it, right? Um, so it's just in terms of you know uh, uh, how it's laid out, it just makes more sense. Um, and again, you're right, you come up to the school and you see this big wall that gets tagged incessantly all the time by somebody, and I paint it, um, <laughs> it gets old. It gets really, really old, it truly does. You know? So there's things that functionally that are, it's just we're better off. And, and just maybe just as one follow up, um, we all know, every one of us, you know, that interacts with this lovely institution that is a center of our community, we know that whatever the address on Google says is the main entrance, we all know and, and interact mm -hmm. through what could be a primary functional, you know, in practice, the true proper or main entrance. So I, is that a bit of a red herring, like, oh, the Google address is Vermont, but we can't uh, create a, a main or primary entrance facing capital? Mm -hmm. I just don't know if that's a red herring. I would not call it a red herring. As an architect, I would say it's a very real issue. Um, uh, but um, I, I really appreciate all of the comments today because I think it's a little bit, it's stronger than we've heard in the past. Um, these these comments, I think if we, I, I also, almost don't even want to turn the board around. <laughs> because what we wanted to do with all of you is to think about our guiding principles. Mm -hmm. that we established at the beginning. And how do these guiding principles now start to show up in the future? Um, what, do, what do they mean for the recommended option? And what, what do they mean to you in terms of kind of your hopes um, for, for, for what they might mean? And um, we've got some 
precedent images, which is our way of saying examples of, of some, some images that might sort of get the wheels greased. Um, we can still do that exercise because it is really important that we think about that. But what I also want to encourage you all to do is, is take this conversation. Um, if you feel strongly about it, you know, put some post-it notes up on the board so that we can document that. Because what we do after every one of these meetings is we get together and we, we think about what, what did we hear today? Um, what does it tell us? Does it, does it make us change something? Does it, does it make it, is there something we can address? Um, or is there something we need to do differently? Um, and you know, throughout this process, every one of those post-it notes has, as you can see, we didn't see strong comments. We didn't, you know, when we did some survey work, it was about 50-50, right? Well, 50-50 does not tell us we should a lot more money to a scheme, right? 50-50 says maybe we should be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and, and go with a scheme that's less expensive and that might allow for some more of the deferred maintenance to happen. So that, that's what we need to weigh is, is what do you want your voice to say today? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, from a process standpoint, I've kind of been waiting for this moment because all the other meetings leading up to this have been about all sorts of choices and ideas. And so I feel like a lot of people were thinking about all sorts of things. But throughout the process, there have been little little messages that have been sent, um, cost trade-offs, um, park rec controlling the pool, um, cost of moving the field around cost of kids not being able to use the field for X number of years. And then other messages are like, we're planning for the long term, 100 years. This is a community investment. We want to make the most of it. We want their experience to be as strong as possible. And what I'm feeling is that, and I understand this, we're at the point where we have to get it down to something that we feel we can sell to the board, that they can accept and sell to the community. And as our friend Don here was concerned about from the community standpoint, the loss of the pool might be something that would cause people to say, well, everybody take one of my pool, I'm gonna you know, deep six this, this proposal. We don't know that, we haven't explored that. I guess my only concern at this point is that some of those open issues, while you're trying to drive us to a, a board presentation, there's still some open issues that I haven't felt confident enough that I can say that's the way to go because it's been presented as we don't know. The difference between moving the track, I look at that grandstand like, like you and like you, it's a horrible edifice from the 50s. And I can't believe that the cost of fixing that, maybe resurfacing the track, maybe doing something with the infield, maybe doing something with the, the field runway pits and so forth. I run around that track, I see what's there. And I'm going like, is it really incrementally that much? And if we don't have the geotech done, and there's still the wind issue open, then I'd be, uh, I, I'm concerned about going forward. We want to do this when we don't know all those other things. And, and I think it's worthwhile for us to spend a little time just going down to the, what do we really want? What's a hundred year amortization of an additional $10 million that gets us a better entrance from Capitol Highway, a safer uh, flow of traffic and pedestrians in scheme two, better facilities for our mm -hmm. sports team, one that might be more utilized across the district if, if yeah. we had the place where people want to go, yeah. Yeah. which you know it are all things that make it work. And what do we do about the pool where you know the year after we open the new school, Portland Park says, you know what, we found a crack in there. We're, We're just going to shut that thing down. <laughs> so, so I think I think for us, for me to be part of this process, I don't mind going through some additional pain with you all, and I know it's painful for you and your team. <laughs> you love this stuff, are you kidding me? Okay, then, then we're in the same boat, because I live for this. Uh, yeah. to, to really hone down what it is we feel, and then communicate to the board why this is it. And then let them, as a board, make the decision on how they sell this to the community. But that's, that's, I'm, I'm just sitting here absorbing, and I really appreciate what everyone's saying. I was a track runner, and I ran on a track that was sort of triangular. <laughs> maybe better. And, yeah, maybe better. No, I was a confused young person when it came to the Metro Championships. But the, um, so I think the things that we are looking at potentially doing are the things that we, our children, and their children will be living and using and I think it's up to us to really, you know, 
make the tough sell. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is like, what's the tough sell and how do we make it? Right. Well, I, I do want to note about the pool since you did mention that. And, and I Many more years, I don't want to say definitely years, but it's not. It's unfortunately in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a facility, you know, it may be a function you could say, but Parks Rec can decide to close yeah. it for other reasons. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they have that. Sounds you know, so those are the kind of things like, you know, we do this and we compromise on, on the pool. I like something written in contract with them that they're going to operate it for 99 years. Yeah. See, you know, that, 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 that's exactly, I, I, I just need to jump in here. I think uh, we as a, a committee that I can charge with designing, you know, this comprehensive planning, yet we're kept in the dark and treated like we can't appreciate those legal or <coughs> policy, uh, you know, the, the, the actual instrument, the real estate instruments that govern these. Like, I think we kind of deserve to understand what is so, what is, what makes those documents, you know, so intractable, the relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel like we're kind of in the dark here. We can't really have that meaningful, oh, that's why. I haven't had that aha moment that, oh, you know, who gets to call the shots? We, and we, we have asked about the pool. I have asked multiple times at multiple meetings and I haven't had my answer. So I pulled up First American Title and I pulled a title report right now. And the land is owned by CPS. So I'm not really understanding what Portland Parks has to do with that pool. And the land is owned, owned by CPS, but the, park, but the pool was built by the city of Portland and became deeded to uh, Portland Parks. So they just and own they the facility? Do they own the ground underneath it? Uh, well, according to your deed, CPS owns the ground underneath it, but there's an agreement with them. They basically own the facility and operate it. But what we know, based on this last board meeting that happened this week, is that that can be changed with an MOU and closed door conversations with local parents running the show so very would quickly. Your, so would your recommendation, I'm not sure if I'm hearing exactly what your recommendation would be, would your recommendation be something that, that you would want the pool to be removed? I'm just saying, I, I think that we have schemes that aren't taking into consideration the full possibility of the site plan, the actual use of the site plan. Because that's the largest hot tub in Portland, and it's only utilized for three months out of the year, maybe if they have staff. So, but but I guess, so Donna's question, we, we agree, it's in the middle of it, but are you recommending that it be removed? Are you recommending that this Would bond you terminate be located? That and well, have one no of the pool. schemes that were initially proposed at our open house was actually relocating the pool. And yeah. so now the whole idea of like constructing a totally new pool is off the table as well. And we were also told that relocating the track was not going to be very costly at all because it's just moving ground. It's just excavating and moving ground is what we were told. That's what and, I heard. And to, That's what I heard. And to maybe just bring it just a little bit differently, if there's a real estate document that PPS is leasing, you know, those facilities or the land and PPS is in the driver's seat and can terminate that relationship with parks, I would like an explanation from PPS why it doesn't choose to exercise its rights to discontinue this relationship. But I haven't seen any type so of real estate instrument that, that, that governs those so relationships. For Don Box, since he's already walked out, but we all heard when before he left, he wanted to make sure to speak for all the people that he used that pool. It was a you know it's loved by the community, um, and so and we want to keep that relationship with Parks and Parks would like to keep the pooler and uh, for us to use school funds to move a pool for the city gets very complicated. We're talking about many, many, many millions of dollars that could be used, like we said earlier, for schools that need roofs and other maintenance and other things district-wide. Yeah, I just would like to know who gets to make the decision of whether that pool stays and if it's within PPS's discretion to make that decision. It's not entirely. Because it's, it's, it's an agreement with parks. That you so. cannot use bond money for maintenance, you have, can only use it for capital investments. And so to talk about the bond would be written. But generally, uh, generally, generally yeah. that's the law, is it's right. for capital improvement projects, not for deferred maintenance. So generally. There's a pretty extensive agreement between parks and schools about trading the use of facilities. They use our gyms, all our fields, half our fields are all <coughs> property. So 
This is beyond just a use agreement. They actually own that facility. They may not own the ground, but it's like a condo. You may not own the ground. They own, own Grant the Bowl. They own Grant Bowl, and those parents just steamrolled it this week. So I, I understand that. I'm just saying it's it's more complicated than just going to them and saying we want to terminate this agreement. We don't want to do this. I anymore. think it'd be good for us to actually have the. We're talking about it's complex, but we don't get to see the yeah. documents that yeah. make it complex. I guess the question would and, be. And I would um, under the understanding that they were going to give that to you right away. I, so I'd like I, to, yeah, I wish the committee could have them, not just myself. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, you've been waiting for yeah. a while. No, sure. Yeah. Um, are there other hot topics like the pool and the relocation of the track that you debated that haven't yet surfaced in this meeting? Um, at this level, uh, I'd say those are the main drivers. You know, where, where the front door is, I mean, was a, was a really big conversation at the beginning. You know, <coughs> as, as someone who went to the school, I wanted the front door to be where we come in on Capitol Highway. I drove my team crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was another really hot issue. And, you know, it just, um, there are, are so many roadblocks to making that work, um, including, you know, the, the road, the traffic, light, that light's already tough, bringing all traffic basically to that rather than being able to disperse it to Vermont. I mean, there are just so many roadblocks. It's like, is it, is it worth it? And, you know, some of the comments that we heard both in the community and from talking with, um, you know, people involved in the project was once people know where the front door is, they know where the front door is and it isn't a big deal that the front door is on Vermont. And so I tried to, myself, I, I, I let that personal preference that I had from my experience four years ago go. So that was another one. Um, you know, we haven't really gotten into the real design of the building and there'll be a lot of big questions that we, we have to answer. Um, for that, there'll be a lot of choices that we have to make uh, to make sure that we can build a really reasonable but amazing school. Um, you know, the structural system, you know, we talked about in the carbon primer that um, concrete and steel are very high carbon materials. Um, can we build this school out of the emerging building technology of mass timber? Well, we have to, we have to explore it. Um, can we spend more money to build it out of mass timber? Maybe not. We, our firm is really quite good at that building technology and we have in a lot of projects been able to make it cost neutral. Will we be able to make it cost neutral here? I don't know. That will be one that will come up about that. You know, it's a pretty compact building. So, but you know, the, the really biggest questions are the track and the pool. And, and Stephanie, would it be, I mean, I, you know, I obviously have a bias. We, we want what's best for our students. We care about the community. Our students are community members. I'm a community member, you're a community member. And so would it be helpful to, to do more writing around the track and field orientation? I mean, the, it sounds like, if I'm predicting accurately, the pool is most likely going to stay where it's at. And so I'm trying to kind of shift my energy. I would love for our students to use the pool. Like if it's covered or heated, that would be amazing. But the track and field, I feel like I maybe need to put some more energy towards it. Martin really said it really well. We want what's best for our students for the long haul. That means we're practicing at Jackson for three years. We, we're okay if we get a new track and field for 150 years. Um, for the pool, right? As all of us said, we've been trying trying to design something that is pool neutral, pool agnostic, whatever right. proof. I think there's, you know, because some conversations have started, what we want to do is give that some space yep. for those conversations to happen. Right. If the pool can be covered, if the pool can go away, yeah. if the pool can be relocated, we want to make sure that we're giving that the space for it to happen. But right now, because that will take months, we don't have those months. We right. still have to make a recommendation to the board for how much budget to allot. And so at this point, 
if there's budget that needs to be allotted for something like that, that will have to be a whole discussion in itself. So we're not letting that derail the process. Right. Okay. The track and field is a little bit different matter because we we have that agency, mm -hmm. and so you know it really does come down to what is the value that the project gets from relocating the track and field mm -hmm. into a different orientation, mm -hmm. and. Does this group think that that value is worth allotting additional funds to the project? That doesn't mean that we might still not be able to relocate the track and field. The really question is, what is the budget we need to recommend to the board to move forward with? And should that budget be increased to make sure that we have enough for the track and field? Or should we say, hey, we've got enough unknowns that if these unknowns come in where we hope they are, we might have enough money to relocate the track and field, but we're not gonna recommend a higher budget for it. It's a really tough equation that Donna and our team have been really in the middle of struggling with, and we're trying to make sure that we can also get on with whatever that bond is. So. Is it known what the timeline is for the Jackson field improvements? Because right now that is not a great field if you've ever been there for soccer right. in the mud pit. So <laughs> is that a realistic, Please. So I, I'm on that. I can speak to that. We, I, we in front of city council. Part of it, the part one of it has been approved. I think there's maybe another yeah. appeal process, but part one has been approved, and it's in different phases. So, excuse me, phase one has been approved. That is to take the bowl and turn that into a multi-use facility, and then it's to do different phases out of that. And again, you know, you know, again, I, you guys are awesome, by the way. Thank you so I much. Right, and and we yeah. appreciate you. And as a former teacher, I, I can't wait for our kids to have awesome classrooms. I mean, I, I wish my kids were younger. But from the chair that I'm sitting from athletics, that's what I'm speaking for. We have an opportunity to create a crown jewel. And we have an opportunity to keep kids here. And we have an amazing schoolhouse on the plan here, but athletics is our front porch. And that's what people see. And we're trying to retain kids that we had, I got to compete with Jesuit, St. Mary's, Lincoln, you name it. I'm telling oh, you right yeah. now, when they walk in, they come and see that and they're like, holy shit, this is awesome. And so we have an opportunity to do something really, really special. And I, I gotta tell you, leaving the track where it's at isn't special. It doesn't seem special. It just seems like, eh, let's just leave it there because we can save money. And I get it, there's lots of dollars involved. I'm not saying, I'm not discrediting that, but we have an opportunity to do something really, really cool. And if we don't, we're gonna miss the boat. And I'm gonna tell you right now, we're just kind of skimming along. And we, we housed Lincoln for three years here, by the way. Like, we did that, right? So, yeah, I mean, we were occupied, right? We've done that. And we, we're fine. You know, we can, we can survive, so. They owe us for our facility, right? <laughs> yeah, we can go mob their facility if we need to. But Jackson would be obviously a space. But I'm just, I, I mean, again, you guys are awesome, and this is rad. But Make sure you we, write those comments down on those social media <laughs> <laughs> and put them on one of those boards yeah. so that we have them. Yes. Like all of the comments yeah. that you have, please yeah. write them on a post-it note so that Donna and I and the team, we all can say this is what we heard today. You know, we're trying to write things down. I got them. <laughs> I got them. But yes. Can we have another CPC meeting? Yes, we have one more, but it'll be after we submit the board packet. When is the board packet submitted? March 5th. What's the purpose of the meeting if it, the packet's already been it's, submitted? Um, it's a report out of what finally goes in the packet. And Donna, there's no way that, this. is there any way that we're tracked in one and go to swim two? Mm -hmm. <laughs> should we do a um, show by no. hands? Well, <laughs> okay, so is the risk with switching to scheme two and asking for more money the potential that they will not include it in the bond because it's too big of a price tag. So is it at all possible to say like scheme one asterisk if like we go with a larger budget for scheme one with an asterisk that allows for the potential to move it to scheme two if like after doing all the testing of the land and everything you're like, oh, we could actually move the track. Like, is there any way to just I think you want sort to do of the other way? Because when you're scoping business requirements or ed specs, you want to have the broadest 
range well, with contingencies to budget. slim down. So and I think it would be it would be better following your point to go scheme two contingent upon the geotechnical report not having a wellspring that's like you know going to impact moving the track onto a gradient slope blah 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 all of the you know like things yeah. like that like the asterisk should be the Back broadest the range one. of business requirements and then you work down within those yeah i just love the idea of, of really thinking about what's most important to you all mm -hmm. you know thinking about what what are those pieces whether it's you know uh, designing something for you know the long term or what, what however those manifest in your words and and really really distilling that down and, and and talking about that today you know whether that's pulling in the guiding principles and leaning into like how how are those guiding principles expressing that if that helps to give you vocabulary whatever that tool might be because um, i think that that's what what helps us um figure out um you know what we need and how we present that I just wanted to offer the perspective that it might be fiscally irresponsible or negligent to be short-sighted, you know, five or $10 million in choosing scheme one, listening to Mike talk about the crown jewel and the investment and keeping kids here, it probably pays for itself and then some in terms of keeping the enrollment figures high, in terms of being able to host other events, and so it might be a short-term upfront investment of that five to 10 million delta, but from what I'm hearing, it's gonna be paid back and then some in dividends, if, especially if we're looking at a 100-year period. Yeah. And our facility has the parking, which is an exception to the PCS rule. We know after meeting with the Cleveland group when we toured Lincoln, Cleveland has no parking spots, and so that automatically makes us a regional site for facilities, for theater, for all of these events because we can host, we can charge Cubs, we can do all of these things. Yeah. So it actually is you know, an opportunity to bring the community into the space so the community has ownership on the space that they paid for with their tax dollars. You know, um, I, I think it is very short-sighted to not take into consideration to leverage everything we have. And we have the most amount of parking spots out of all of PCS. We should be looking at this as a regional, you know, opportunity, not just something for Hillsdale and Southwest Fork or Cleveland. So I feel like that aligns with our guiding principles and our mission statement and our vision, whatever, right? Whereas talking about pickleball and the pool and parking does not. And so ultimately that is, I think, where the tension is. Um, we, we, we need to stay focused on the mission. We need to stay focused on what we said we wanted to, to present, not on what we think is super practical and cost-effective and gonna be accepted. So I see some of you writing on post-it notes. I'd love if you could take some minutes right now to write down some of your own thoughts on post-it notes. We could really use those also. Uh, that board right there has the guiding principles on it. Um, whether you want to put it on the boards here that have Scheme 1 on them and, and comment any, you don't have to comment only on Scheme 1. All of the comments that you've been making, just put them on there. Um, we also have a board on air quality, if you have any lingering comments on that. Um, and Amelie is noting that you go up. Uh, what do you look for? That one. Um, you know, we've already started trying to think about some of the attributes of the various schemes and how some of the goals of the guiding principles have started to show up. So, but um, any, all of your comments? Because also we want to be respectful of your time and it's <coughs> closing. <laughs>